It's a seven o'clock, guys. We're going to start. Okay. And, uh, we're going to have you. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to a, a new member of, of our community that, uh, that is not new to the city, but new to us that we just met her last week. New her name is Lauren Embersall. Yes. Okay. And uh, she lives on Buell Street. Good memory. <laughs> And I'll let you introduce, have everybody else introduce themselves. Okay, awesome. Okay, Good. okay. should I, I can go first. So yep. I, I am, Keith was right, I am new to the city too. I moved to Burlington in November, or not November, I don't know why I said that, in May. <laughs> um, and I live on Buell Street, so I am not a student. Uh, I am a fully working professional adult, but I am excited to get more involved with Ward 8, and especially knowing that we have, we are the student district, but there are people other than the students here. So I'm very interested in that dynamic and getting to know everyone. Anne, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Oh, you've got two choices. This is a press conference. <laughs> Uh, my name is Anne Brenya, and I live on Bradley Street. Where on Beale Street do you live? I live at, right at the end of Hungerford. So probably I'm in that big blue house uh, at the corner of Hungerford and Buell. So, um, and my back is close to Bradley. Okay. Where that giant parking lot of all the cars are. Uh, right. I'm okay. not in that house, but the one next to it on Hungerford. <laughs> right. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Good. Well, welcome to the yeah. neighborhood. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, definitely welcome. We're very nearby. Yes, yeah, I remember you're on Hungerford, right, Linda? Yeah. And how long have you been in Hungerford, Linda? Over 30, 30 years. years. Yeah, and I also live on Hungerford. Um, I live in the Brown House all the way by College Street. Okay. I walk by your house on my way here then. <laughs> lots of, well, less flowers now, lots of flowers in the driveway. Oh yes, you're my, I do love your house then. I always admire your flowers when I walk by. <laughs> uh, I'll tell my husband, I have nothing to do with them except say that they take up too much room, but. <laughs> it's your house, take the credit. <laughs> so, and I kind of live catty corner for Maddie. Yeah. Okay. Closer to you. Okay. Okay. I can picture so, it. Anyway, welcome to the neighborhood. And, you know, it's nice to have like a long-term non-student resident join us. And I'm going to make a motion that we, um, uh, that we nominate Lauren to be part of the steering committee for the Ward 8 NPA. I'll second. Okay. And all Ward 8 people are allowed to vote. So all those in favor say aye. Hi. Hi. Oh. Okay. <laughs> now we have a Scott Rogers here. Is that somebody that? He works for Cedo. Oh, he works at Cedo. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, is there any announcements? Um, I, I need to announce that I did resign as a ward clerk a couple of weeks ago. Oh. Several reasons. One was one of the ones that's been bothering me for a long time is how the elections are going in the dorms and. They don't seem to be accessible to non-students. And then, of course, my leg, I had it in a cast. So I said, okay, good reason. I will. I have a political reason and I have a physical reason. So I resigned. My neighbor across the street, John Alexander, who's a young father and a lawyer. He's been on my street over 10 years. He's got two children. He, uh, I didn't tell him all the work it was, but he, he uh, volunteered to do it. And I've given him the list of all people who've helped me in the past. Did you get a letter yet from him? I did not get a letter. Okay. But mail He'll probably be emailing you. Okay. So he will be uh, doing the uh, the election in, in November and then the special election in December for our district uh, city councilor. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So Is he going to need, if you're, Keith, if you're not going to be the ward clerk, does, does, is, Will there have He's to be interim ward clerk until we have the election in March? Oh, okay. So, uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Great. Claire, we're, we are going to have a short meeting today so that because we know you're very busy. 
and we're going to ask you to introduce your speaker and we will go continue on this we we feel that you're you're really engaged in what you're doing and we don't want to take up a lot of your time but we have people here that need this information okay so i'll let you do the introductions you know, okay and I, I, i'm assuming that uh, sasha is coming online yes sasha. and what would you say sasha is coming online. Sasha? That Chandra? Okay. And also Kathy, will she be online? She's here. She's here. Okay. Okay. So did, should we wait a bit or? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, wait, give us an introduction. We need this. This guy needs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There, we, we need to have. Yeah. What's that? Absolutely, Nathan. Perfect. You know, we're organized in Ward 8. We're few, <laughs> but we're organized. And I, I don't want to show my bias about Nathan. Nathan, you know, I want I want Claire, the chairman of the school board, who is a hardworking woman. <laughs> and I want her to introduce her uh, her staff. And uh, I'll probably belt for every word she says. <laughs> Great. Hi. Okay, so we'll start because it's yeah. seven. Um, good evening, my name is Claire Wool. I am a school board chair, the Burlington School Board. I've been fortunate to be working uh, in the, this capacity for the past five years and a parent of three, uh, two graduates of BHS through the school system and one a senior at BHS. I am very happy and appreciative of the, of the organizing efforts of Ward 8 uh, to be here tonight uh, and speak to you. This is a critical time for the school district. Um, we have worked tirelessly uh, along with Keith, the former school board member, uh, in my past 10 years um, in addressing the needs of this high school. So before PCBs were even discovered, um, this high school was determined uh, by the community 70 percent of 72% in 2018 to pass a bond for renovation of this high school. Um, number one, it's not ADA accessible, and two, that it was in, uh, very inefficient um, uh, for a number of reasons and was costing the taxpayers a lot of money, um, educational dollars that um, we wanted to put back into the school district. At this time, we returned that uh, $70 million bond. We returned 66 million. We used 4 million of that bond for site um, exploration and um, conditions to get us where we are. So um, that money was not wasted. We would have spent that money in the efforts that we're putting forth today. Um, so I want to be really clear that bond amount was uh, returned, the 66 million, and we started over with this project um, and, and purposing. Um, currently, our high school is uh, supported in downtown Macy's. It is a temporary lease. It costs us a million dollars a year in educational dollars. And we are to be vacating that lease as of 2025. Um, the governor was fortunate enough to give us $3.5 million to up fit the department store into a high school, but it clearly, come sit up here, Stephanie, yeah. Um, but it is clearly a department, old department store and is a Band-Aid. So here we are now coming to taxpayers for a $165 million bond. Um, and we uh, are looking for taxpayer support because um, this is a need, not a want. Um, and our need is to, uh, be able to open our doors in 2025 for the future students of BHS. Uh, we have gone through a very engaged process with the public on the location. We own the property, it's an amazing site. And the tax implications are great. And we want uh, to communicate out to Ward 8 residents that this is our call to mobilize as a city. Um, all of us Burlingtonians should be um, alarmed and concerned uh, and um, joining us in the efforts to address the governor and our federal delegation, Bernie's hometown high school and Senator Leahy, as well as Governor uh, Congressman Welsh. There are dollars earmarked at the state level. There are $32 million for PCB remediation and addressing uh, schools that have um, issues with PCBs. We're first in line for that money. We're the only school in the state that's been shut down uh, by per order of the um, uh, health department, uh, state toxicologist, and um, 
We also know that the governor in his state of the state address addressed career technology education, and we're looking for um, close to $20 million in support for the um, BTC portion of our campus, which half of our Burlington High School students attend along with nine other ascending schools. So I have talked rap rapid fire, but I, um, I'm here with uh, Commissioner Alwell uh, and Executive Director Nathan Lavery, our Financial Director for the District, um, to answer questions um, and also go through the presentation that our school board, our school leadership has present has um, created and presented uh, to other MPAs and throughout the um, city councilors and the mayor and throughout the city organizations, and and really the school district cannot. Um, campaign for the vote. Uh, it's up to the school board members and citizens um, for the passage of this bond. And so it comes, your meeting comes at a timely uh, hour because ballots were mailed and will be received by everyone by, by October 1st. Um, and that's why uh, that was my introduction, long-winded as it is, but um, thank you. And I am going to recuse myself and give Kathy the seat because this is your your ward and your uh, <laughs> with, with your ward with Saja you're representing. And Claire, but, just before you go, if yeah. people want to get involved, if they want to get your signs, they want to help yeah, with the kind of effort around organization. Where do so, they go and yes. who do they reach out to? Um, if you go on the BSD website, all of our uh, emails are there and phone numbers, uh, cell phone numbers or home numbers uh, and that still exist. And so we are looking for volunteers. Um, we don't want it to just be the school board. And we have a long list of um, citizens that are um, committed to supporting us. And we'd love you to join us um, over the next five weeks um, and speak to your friends and neighbors. So reach out to me, uh, cwool at bsdvt.org. But again, bsdvt.org, Burlington School District website has all of our contact information, as well as our literature that we've been handing out. But thank you very much for your time. Yeah, you have the presentation. Great. Okay. Thanks for putting the presentation up. Um, again, my name is Nathan Lavery. I'm the Burlington School District's Executive Director of Finance and Operations. Thanks for having us tonight. We're excited to give you a brief presentation about the project, um, and certainly we'll leave plenty of time for questions. So we want to uh, begin by just providing a video to give people a sense of what this school could look like. So I'm just going to pause and let the let the video run here. So we can see it on TV. Okay. Okay. Great, thank you. There is sound associated with that video if you watch it online, by the way. I don't know if that was coming through on, on the tape or not. So brief history of how we got here. Um, obviously, uh, 
Commissioner Wool was uh, provided a little bit of background here, but folks, um, there is some extra information here. The re the re-envisioning project. Um, it's I want to just reiterate uh, the point that she made that voters might remember the seventy million dollars that was passed, um, and that was great. But we spent just a tiny fraction of that money, and uh, before we discovered the presence of PCBs, that ultimately uh, resulted in the need to close the high school. So. Um, just to kind of be really explicit about it, the bond that we're uh, that we have on the ballot this November is not in addition to that seventy million, but for four million, the rest of that seventy million is is not been spent and has been has been returned. So that's been a common question. We want to uh, make sure that folks are are clear on that. Um, after discovering that having the the PCB specifically having to shut down the school, we were able to relocate students to a temporary home in in Macy's, which has been great. <laughs> but it is a temporary home and it's important uh, to everyone involved in the school district, I believe, that we find a permanent home for our students in a new high school. There's a brief timeline. The design that we have uh, that we've put forward and that you can see on the screen is not the only idea. We actually had a design team of architects come up with multiple options. They were reviewed not only by our school board, but we had staff and community input in that process. Ultimately, the board elected what was at the time option C. One of the things to understand about option C is that um, it happened to be the least expensive of the design options, although that wasn't the primary reason for selecting it. Uh, I think the way the site was situated, uh, the building in this location made the most sense. It was a compact building. It offered a campus feel. Um, while at the same time making uh, good use of the surrounding landscape and, and offering connections to, to the outdoors. So option C was selected. We move forward. We've also engaged uh, Leonine Public Affairs to support our efforts to draw down additional state and federal funds to help pay for this project. But that is a painstaking process. And our students can't wait for that to play out before we actually continue the process of getting uh, firms engaged to build the school. Hence our ultimate request that is on the ballot for $165 million. That would give us enough money in combination with funds that we've already identified. And then I'll speak to further. That would give us enough money to complete the project um, on our timeline, which is to have the building open in August of 2025. Briefly, we'll cover just a few images of the site itself beginning here. You could see um, the high school, the new high school and technical center will be located completely north of Institute Road. It will, to some extent, overlap some of the existing buildings, but many of those buildings um, kind of go up the hill. If you can think kind of vertically on the slide that we're looking at here. This school is, uh, the alignment's kind of different on the site. And one of the features is that you can see quite obviously is that the parking has been shifted up the hill and behind the school. Those familiar with the current site know that the parking is kind of like the first thing you see when you approach that site. There's a sea of, of pavement and, and cars. Now the parking will be located behind the building and it will be much more of a kind of have much more curb appeal, I think, in terms of uh, the way it looks. But uh, some other uh, features that you can see on here on the right side of the screen, there's a courtyard that offers additional natural light into the building. Natural light, something that we heard very much from students in particular and staff as well, that was important to incorporate into the design. So there's a lot of surface area to bring in natural light and there's even a courtyard to help enhance that. There are also some places for outdoor classrooms where um, that, are, that are close by the campus. And uh, again, connections to the arms force and the other kind of outdoor elements. So there's a uh, kind of a much more compact design of this building than the current high school, which is a series of buildings that are connected by breezeways. One of the other advantages of that is that it's going to be a much more secure building from a safety standpoint, as well as a much more efficient building from an energy standpoint. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a view from the south entrance. So this is looking across Institute Road. Um, you can see kind of on the right side of the screen, a, uh, a large kind of glass area that's that's going to be facing North Avenue. So again, you kind of have a nice presence on North Avenue um, that is a few stories 
high from that direction. And then as you can kind of see, looking on the length of the building, there's setbacks so that the building doesn't have a huge <laughs> imposing feel, even though it goes up um, it goes up high the, as it kind of steps back. It has a kind of more human scale when you're um, kind of at the, at the ground level. Uh, next slide, please. This is the north entrance. So as you saw kind of from the video, there's both a south entrance and a north entrance into the high school and the technical center. That is important both for accessibility. Um, there's parking again on the north side. There's a, a loop for bus drop off on the south side. And, and um, But also both of these entrances feed into what we will see is a large common area in the in the middle, um, what we're calling student commons. So there's two ways to access that. And that's important as well, because as folks familiar with the site know, it is on a hillside, it slopes. So um, we wanna make sure that it's easy to get to the entrances, whether you're coming from the north or the south. Here's just a conceptual classroom here. The features that we really wanna emphasize again is the abundance of natural light, which is a feature of the design overall. Um, another feature that's not so much a feature of the design, but of how we intend to use it. You can see that this image features uh, tables that have wheels on it and kind of uh, other opportunities for seating. It's not just a row of wooden desks that are almost immovable in the room without a tremendous difficulty. The idea is to create flexible space, both for the use, uh, use when the, even in a traditional classroom setting, but also so that the rooms can easily be transitioned to, to other uses throughout the day. This is a rendering of the student commons. Again, as I mentioned, the entrances on the north and south side are on different, are different elevations. So you can see, obviously, the commons is a bright, open, airy space. Um, one of the things that we heard from students repeatedly and the design teams really look to incorporate into the design is to afford students with opportunities to gather together that are outside of the classroom, whether that's gathering together to do work or just to relax, have a little snack, whatever it might be. Um, we wanted to make sure that that was a feature of the design because that was something that students said was really missing from our current high school. So this student commons is an attempt to provide some of those spaces while connecting the whole building. It's off the student commons. You'll see on some other slides, there's access to um, auditorium, gymnasium, and so forth. Here's a rendering of the auditorium. It'll be 750 seats with a balcony. One of the advantages of that is it allows us to offer that additional seating in the balcony without needing additional floor space. Um, again, we're doing everything we can to keep this project as affordable to the community as possible. So that was a way to ensure that we had adequate capacity in the auditorium while also reducing ultimately the cost of the building by um, reducing the floor space. And here's a shot of the learning center or what has uh, traditionally been called the library in, in uh, many high schools. Again, feature here, abundance of natural light, a space that is open and flexible and can, uh, can accommodate different types of furniture uh, as and really with the hope ultimately that the school, which um, you know, is going to be with us for generations is something that can adapt to the changing instructional environment that um, you know, only some of which we can anticipate. When it comes to the cost, which is obviously a major consideration in any construction project, we have projected that it will increase taxes in Burlington, um, and we've estimated at the top end about 15 and a half percent. But that's that comes with a significant, really a few significant caveats that we're going to talk about. Um, one is our commitment to continue to raise money to reduce the amount of uh, total money we have to borrow, meaning that even if the school district is authorized to borrow 165 million. If we are able, and we believe we will be successful, but if we're able to bring in additional funds to support the project, and we therefore don't need to borrow $165 million, that's going to reduce the um, amount of money that we have to repay. It's going to reduce our debt service. And ultimately, that means that the tax impacts won't be as high. We also know that there are changes to the state's funding formula related to how pupils are counted. And while that effort's going to allow us to make some important investments in serving some of our neediest students, it's also likely to mitigate, to some extent, the projected tax rate increase. One other 
element of the uh, potential borrowing associated with the project and the resulting impact on taxes that I think is really important to highlight is that it's not all going to happen at once. We are likely to borrow funds over a period of probably three, possibly even four years to build the project, beginning uh, earlier in the process with the money, for example, that would be borrowed to help clean up the existing site, remove the old buildings that are there, do it properly, because again, some of those uh, buildings have various contaminants. The most obvious one that's in every building is our, um, our PCBs, but there's other things we need to be careful with when we're cleaning it up. So that's going to be the first major phase of the project, and we'll be borrowing some money for that before we transition into um, constructing the new school. So as this chart shows, the borrowing is phased in, and therefore the resulting impact on our budget and, and taxes is also something that accumulates over time. It doesn't just hit people all in the first year. We've published a chart, um, and if it's difficult to read in the slides, it's available on our website. It's just uh, an easy way for people who pay their education taxes solely based on the value of their house site to kind of quickly reference approximately what the impact uh, will be in uh, potentially in their in their situation. Again, this assumes fully bonding for 165 million, so there's a, a real possibility that it's less than that. But in the interest of full transparency, we thought we should provide the community with that kind of uh, maximum case scenario. And then we have a couple of charts and they're also in the handouts that attempt to provide people with some sense of what the impact would be if you are someone who qualifies for the education uh, credit, the income-based education credit. So then this chart is intended for people to kind of find their income level across the top, find their home value, uh, kind of on, on the left side there. And where those two points intersect is the estimated annual um, impact on, on taxes. This is the same version of that chart, but this one shows the monthly impact again. It's a kind of a multiple uh, axes here. So we had to do two charts, but it's the same type of annual and, and monthly in this case uh, information. Okay, so... I've mentioned a couple times already the district's efforts to reduce the burden on taxpayers through, um, and I wanted to talk about some of the progress we've already made. So already the district has identified opportunities to put substantial money toward the project that doesn't need to come from new borrowing and therefore new taxes. Part of that is funds that we have already saved or anticipate we'll be able to manage through um, careful stewardship of our own budget. We expect to be able to contribute at least $5 million for that. That doesn't mean that we're increasing the budget and then just um, collecting that money. Rather, it means even without increasing the budget, we think that through efficiencies and careful management of our financial resources over a period of a few years, we'll be able to generate those funds. We've already uh, identified in, in actual savings 1.5 million, and we expect to be able to make a further dent in that soon. Another major source is $10 million of funding from the uh, elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds. Those were COVID relief funds. Uh, we have um, received a major influx of money from that federal legislation, and we're committed to putting $10 million either directly or indirectly toward offsetting the cost of the building. Additionally, we've reallocated $10 million from our existing capital plan to support the high school. That plan already had some money in it to support the high school, but we've further shifted resources toward the high school because it is such a high priority. Additionally, um, not only have we identified funds to help pay for the cost of the project, on the other hand, we've also looked at opportunities to reduce the cost of the project. And one of the major decisions that the board made was to relocate a portion of the Burlington Technical Center programs permanently to the airport. One of the ways that uh, we were able to afford doing that is we were the recipient of a major $10 million federal uh, influx of, of funds uh, secured through the work of, of Senator Leahy and his team, as well as our aviation uh, program staff, Moses Daly. So in addition to the money that we've identified to help pay for the cost of the building, we've also looked for ways to reduce the cost of the building. We're really excited about the potential partnership with the airport and with um, some of the firms at the airport, in particular beta technologies. So 
We're really excited about what the opportunities are there for our students in the future. And having the tech center be located primarily at a combination of the airport Institute road will certainly be a lot better from a student experience than what we have right now, which is satellite uh, locations for the tech center all over the place. Because again, that was another um, program that was displaced by the need to close the, uh, the Institute road campus. We're continuing to work to identify additional federal and state dollars. Um, there are a lot of programs, as you can imagine, that are out there, federal and state, that are associated with things like the stormwater that we might be, uh, treatments that we might be putting on the site, other environmental investments, um, energy efficiency. We plan to partner with Burlington Electric Department to identify what opportunities there are to create incentives and have an even more efficient building. That's not only um, you know, the opportunity to reduce our costs up front in working with Burlington Electric and drawing down incentives, but obviously over the long run, a more efficient building is going to be cheaper for us to operate. A cheaper building means lower taxes at the end of the day. Um, so there's a lot of effort to go in there, but that is a painstaking process and there's a long way to go before we can bank on, on any of that money. We've also starting an effort to fundraise through donations um, in a kind of more traditional fundraising program. We are partnering with the Burlington Students Foundation in an effort to receive donations. We've already um, kind of got a, gone off to a good start there, but certainly that's an opportunity for folks who are interested in giving directly to the project to do so. So in short, we are committed to raising more funds for the project, even if the bond passes. And even after that point, we're going to continue that effort. We know that's a multi-year effort. And we're confident that we can, um, you know, make a real, uh, make a real, have a real impact on bringing down that that cost of the project to, to voters. So we are um, kind of in the the point in our timeline here where the next major milestone is going to be the bond vote that culminates on November eighth. If that passes. We would expect demolition um, of the old site to begin possibly as early as December, more likely January, February, but clearly over the winter, the goal being to have the demolition completed over the winter so that as the weather warms up and the ground thaws, we can actually begin construction of the new high school. Um, and again, the kind of move-in date for that is August 2025. So it's going to be a multi-year project, but one that we are confident um, if we can stick to the schedule that we'll be able to, to meet that deadline. And uh, that's, I think, it for the presentation. So we'll stop there. And if there are questions from the room or, or people attending virtually, we're happy to answer them. One of the major selling points of the $70 million bond was better security, uh, better energy use, efficiency, uh, accessibility, and fire, uh, water, water, I guess, coming out of the ceiling, whatever that's called. Fire production. I, I'm assuming that's all taken care of here. We have a up to date. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's one of the real um advantages of of building new you know in that renovation project we were trying to achieve all those goals within a, a framework with the bones so to speak of a building that really wasn't designed to do many of those things very well certainly not not a very accessible building um, not very energy efficient building those those breezeways and those ramps you know uh, kind of made both of those things difficult to achieve so this building um almost inherently because of its more compact design is going to be more energy efficient. There's also going to be multiple elevators. We're still on a hillside. We still have a multiple story building, but uh, they've put a lot of the architects put a lot of thought into how making sure that the building is um, accessible from both uh, again, the North and South side that you're never too far from an elevator so that if you need to use the elevator, you can easily move between floors. And they've also thought about just general, generally how the circulation will work in the building so that students can easily get to uh, from one class to another. And, and the floor plan kind of has blocks of classrooms that are, uh, that are contiguous and, and should make that a lot, a lot more easy. It's obviously going to have the, uh, be up to date with all the 
um, fire codes and all of the kind of standard uh, elements of that. But I think security will also be greatly improved, both um, in terms of the types of features such as having um, uh, locks and the kind of electrical locks that we can engage, but also just having a design that allows for supervision of the entrances and frankly, fewer entrances than we have at the old school, which has numerous entrances. Um, and then the again, the design of this building being much more compact will dramatically improve the kind of sight lines and the visibility around the building. If you can think of the old campus and how broken up it is, it would be very easy to kind of like duck and dive between buildings and kind of um, you know be difficult to identify who who's out there and where. This building is going to be much easier to surveil, if you will, um, and and that should help as well. And also, it should be. I mean. The plan is to have it net zero or as close to that as we can get. Yeah, that's a great, great point, Kathy. Um, it will be net zero ready. So um, it's possible that it will even be net zero when it opens. But if not, it'll be net zero ready so that as the technology improves, um, it could truly be a net zero building. There is substantial uh, space on the roof of the building already identified for solar. And we're working with a... Um, a firm in Vermont that uh, we could partner with to install solar on the building as well. Is the footprint of the uh, school building plus parking going to be the same, or is it uh, is the parking area expanded? Um, that's a good question. Let's see if I can recall the exact difference here. Off the top of my head, I, I'm not sure what the, the parking footprint is. Do you recall, Kathy? Are we going? I just remember a discussion that it was close to the same number of parking places. Because if I remember rightly, yep. the student parking, which is across the street, where that stays, doesn't it? The stu separate. Yep, the student parking stays. The chain, I'm trying to remember how many how many stalls there are. It's, there's not a substantial difference in parking, for sure. Um, but there are we have the uh, there are certain standards that we have to build build to with respect to parking i can definitely look up the exact difference between um between what we have now and what, what but it it's not be. significantly different it's not significantly different no. parking no no i think what it will be significantly different with respect to parking is really the bike parking there's going to be substantially more bike parking available than there is at the current building but there's not going to be substantially more vehicular parking um i'd have to get the exact counts to to check that it's been a while since i looked at those numbers and you mentioned um that you're trying to leverage for additional funding to reduce that 165 million um over what period of time will that number be changeable um good question so the way that the borrowing will work as i said it'll kind of be phased in so at a minimum um, we can obviously, during those first few years, we can easily just not borrow as much money if we have more. If we find ourselves in a position where we have, at, at any point, whenever we get through and we're, we're finished borrowing, if we then subsequently uh, receive an award, for example, from some state program or something of that nature, we will be able to um, use the funds potentially if not directly on the project to set them aside in a debt service fund that'll allow us to then pay it out against the debt service. Um, so there's a possibility that even funds received after the project is completed could help reduce the tax burden. But the primary goal and the hope would be that we would be able to get some significant funding over the next few years so that we wouldn't have to borrow the money at all in the first place. Um, and because again, we're phasing it in, even if we begin, let's say, as the chart showed, and and borrow thirty million to begin the um, the demolition and abatement, perhaps that next year, instead of borrowing, you know, sixty five million or seventy million, we would need to borrow maybe only sixty million, and so we could uh, make that determination. And not to get too technical, but um, another opportunity to kind of extend that is that um, we are not necessarily going to. When we borrow that money the first time, we're not necessarily going to immediately use a 20 or 30 year bond. We may do what's called a bond anticipation note in consultation with the city, which essentially means you borrow the money for one year. At the end of that one year term, that's the bond anticipation. You then convert it to a long term bond. 
that just extends the period of time we have to to um to kind of phase in the borrowing and allows us to adapt to the changing financial situation. So if we get a bond anticipation note for let's say $30 million, and then a year later when we need to convert that, convert that to an actual bond, if we've raised additional other funds, the bond that we converted into might not be 30 million, it might be let's say 25 million. So there are some opportunities there and, and we'll work closely with the city to make sure that we minimize um, or really do everything we can with the funding we have to minimize the cost of that borrowing, whether it's considering the term of the bond, how much we borrow, what other sources we've brought in. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of, between now and, and 2025, I think there's going to be a lot of changes in the, the borrowing conditions um, in the world. And we're going to have to keep a close eye on that. And I think we can take advantage of that um, to kind of, again, keep the cost as manageable to our community as, as possible. there been any steps to the best of your ability kind of future proofing um so in you know leaving room for potential new construction and avoiding a situation like pcbs i know sometimes that can't be um, predicted but i'm just curious if that was part of the projections as well yeah great great question well as you can imagine um the design team is very intent on a design that uses Material building materials that don't are not known to have any significant <laughs> yeah. environmental risk. That would obviously be, um, uh, you know, a huge mistake. And and so, to the extent that there is knowledge of that, um, you know, we're going to be very careful about that. But um, you asked about the potential to kind of expand the building. So, um, if you go back and look at the kind of overhead view of the site, there is space. If you're looking at the at screen, kind of between where the um, between North Avenue and the um and the east end of the building that is specifically identified as a possible site of future expansion specifically that that's also the wing where most of the classrooms are so it's a natural place to put um additional classrooms if they're if they're needed the other thing to understand about any building like this is it's designed to uh with an anticipated enrollment figure in mind we made sure that that anticipated enrollment figure isn't today's enrollment Right, we did a reasonable look at how many students have been at that high school at different times in its history. We didn't build um, to accommodate the absolute maximum either, because that hasn't we haven't been at that high of a level in in many years. So we tried to do a reasonable um, estimate for what they call the design enrollment. So there is some capacity there, and even that design enrollment um, isn't the actual capacity. You can squeeze more seats in the classroom in, in many cases and so forth. So um, in terms of kind of the possibility of growth, we both have expansion opportunities, but we we will have some room in that building without immediately needing to build an expansion. I don't want to suggest that that's like, you know, the, the very first thing that will happen if a few more housing units go up, that that won't be immediately necessary in any, any scenario. And then to the extent that your question may uh, also imply like kind of other features of the building. I mean, we're trying to build the spaces flexibly as we can to allow for whatever those changes are that we can't anticipate very reasonably. Um, and also trying to, again, make sure that the building from an efficiency standpoint is equipped with the tools to um, generate its own energy so that as uh, solar technology and so forth becomes more efficient, we can take advantage of it. Yeah. Did Linda or Kathy have any, or Maddie have any questions? So, so okay, Linda. So I had a question. So, um, uh, uh, hang on a second. I'm hearing some uh, feedback. Um, I watched the tape of the Ward Six MPA meeting where the presentation was given, and at that meeting, um. There was a discussion of what the difference between net zero ready and net zero. And I think it was kind of thrown out as a completely estimate um, that it might cost another $30 million to become move from net zero ready to net zero. Can you clarify that for me and whether that would involve more taxes? Sure. So um yeah, so the first answer is to kind of maybe your your main point. Um, 
I don't think we have a concrete estimate on that, but there is no plan to increase taxes to make the build to, to kind of guarantee the building is net zero. So I'll just want to like say that and I'll, I'll come back to it, but kind of that's probably your, um, you know, the main question there. So just, I won't go into detail on this because I'm not an expert either, but I'll give you my high level understanding. Um, the idea of net zero in a building like this would mean that the site itself can create enough energy to completely meet its demand for energy, right? So all the lights, all the computers, all of the things that are taking energy in the building, that that energy need would be met by things like the solar panels. Current solar technology combined with the amount of roof space we have is not sufficient to generate enough energy based on how much energy we expect the building to require. Those are inherently estimates. We'll, you know, once people start using the building, we'll have more, um, you know, more evidence of that. But the point is, we don't think that there will be able to be enough solar on that roof to be truly net zero given today's solar technology. There's the, when I say it's going to be net zero ready, it means that the building will have the equipment and the infrastructure in place such that if we could generate more energy on that site, which um, that, could power the building, then we would be able to achieve net zero. One possible way to do that, for example, would be to put up a whole lot more solar on other places at the 52 Institute Road campus. However, right now that would involve either putting a lot of solar panels up over our green space, if there is enough of that, um, which would you know, really eliminate a lot of the green space that, that I think is important to our, our students and, and, uh, and kind of the fuel of the campus. Um, maybe the least kind of invasive way, if you will, to add extra solar would be to put it on canopies that cover the parking. But as you can imagine, building big steel structures over all that parking is also very expensive. That's not in the plan right now. Doing that would add a lot more cost, and we are not planning to do that at a cost to the taxpayers. There is a possibility that we could achieve something like that through a contractual agreement with some of these firms where um, whereby essentially they pay the upfront cost of installing that extra solar. And in effect, the way we repay them is that we don't get the full benefit of that, uh, the savings that um, to our electric bill that that solar power generates. So if you can think of it, it's kind of like they say, hey, if you'll if you will give us some of the savings that you get from this extra solar, we'll give you the money up front to build it. So we're going to have those conversations, um, even if that's not part of the design or the, the, um, a feature of the, the site when the school opens. There's still a possibility that it could come online in the future. And more generally, um, as solar technology improves, and the solar panels are more efficient and able to capture more energy from the sun in a smaller uh, amount of square footage, it may become the case that the solar panels, as they get upgraded on the roof, are sufficient to generate all the power that the building needs. So that's kind of what we're talking about in terms of the building being net zero ready, but not necessarily net zero on day one. Um, we don't anticipate and don't have any plans to increase the cost of the project to kind of force it into a net zero state. Um, you know, we're just going to design it as efficiently as we can, get as close as we possibly can and, um, and operate within the, the planned budget. I have another question when it's my turn again. We've got, uh, we're actually going to use geothermal. It's going to be a major feature of that. We've done um, testing on the site. And uh, they drill these test wells. Again, I'm not a technical expert in this, but they go way down. They have to find a certain differential in the temperature. And um, it looks like that the site is very promising for, for geothermal. So that's going to be a major, um, uh, the major kind of tool for heating and cooling the building. Yes, that is part of the cost. Correct. Okay, Linda. Um, so I have a, a question. It's a little bit a different subject here. Um, it has to do with the timeline and the cost. So I know that, you know, we need the high school yesterday, but still getting it done by 2025 seems like it might be kind of aggressive 
Um, I, from everything I've heard, it's very hard to find people to work. And I'm just wondering how you're considering the costs and the timeline and the, the, whether or not you'll be able to find enough people to do the work. Right. And you're, you're absolutely right that it is an aggressive schedule. Again, we consulted with, um, with our design team as well as construction firms. They agreed that it was both an aggressive schedule and an achievable one. In fact, their belief is that the, the most risk in terms of schedule risk for the project is actually more in the design phase that we're in right now. And that if we can complete the design in time to bid out the project to construction firms um, on our current schedule, that we, are, that we should be able to meet it. But we've also seen kind of unprecedented changes in the, the labor market generally. And so that you're, there's no doubt that there's always a risk there. Again, it's, um, and you know, we hope that that doesn't, doesn't materialize. I should note that the budget includes some escalation factors, some, some contingency costs, if you will, anticipating costs going up over time. So we have, uh, we've kind of played it safe in the budgeting for the project, but at the end of the day, we think it's achievable, but you're absolutely right that there's, you know, there is risk there in terms of ensuring that um, there's a sufficient workforce to do the work. I would note that it's common in a project of this size and scope, um, not all of that labor is going to be coming locally. Like they're the construction manager that we've hired, Whiting Turner is uh, part of a national network, so they have access to to folks all over the country who could potentially work on the project. And, and there's a plan B for if it's not done on time. I wouldn't say there's a plan B um, in a big picture sense, but we are going to be discussing the possibility of uh, extending our lease at Macy's if we need a little bit of extra time to finish the project. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We want to be respectful of your time. We said till eight at seven forty-five. And it is just a little bit of seven fifty-two. Kathy, I didn't want to ignore you. Thank Kathy Orwell is our district school commissioner, and we appreciate your being here. And uh, thank you for both coming tonight. You're welcome. And I just wanted to say to people that we also have postcards as well as yard signs and postcards we hope people will take and you can call me or any of the board members to get some of these to send out to friends and neighbors asking them to please vote yes on the school on the VHS bond and we also have yard signs here and we will have them also in, you know, I'll have them at my house or I could bring them by anyone's house if they needed one and stick in the yard. So, well, thank you very much for coming and thank you all for coming. This is our second Ward 8 NPA and we appreciate your attendance. Good night. <laughs>